today I'm joined by Greg Keller, Chief Strategy Officer at Jump Cloud. Welcome, Greg. Hey, it's good to be here, Scott. All right, so my understanding is that you went to Syracuse and you majored in foreign diplomacy. Was the original aspiration to join the State Department or maybe in some diplomatic capacity? Yeah, great question. Yeah, and I often get challenged on how the heck did you end up in technology when you went to school to study, study foreign diplomacy and languages? And uh, the answer is uh, a long history of family sort of association. My brother uh, was a huge influence. He is a recently re retired uh, major general uh, within the Army uh, in intelligence and special operations for a very, very long time, major influence. Syracuse University is one of uh, effectively three schools in the nation that really has a high posture of State Department graduates um, and people focused on, um, call it, you know, um, international relations and that style of government. Um, so uh, the Maxwell School of Citizenship, which is the Syracuse school that I went to, uh, Harvard's JFK School and American University School are the sort of three top schools that focus on this. And really what it comes down to is, is relation building. It really comes down to understanding other people's problems, um, how to remediate them. In fact, a lot of what I studied was nonviolent conflict resolution, believe it or not, outside of other languages on how to communicate with others. Um, and the way to just tear apart a problem, but present it kindly, <laughs> but asserting your own position. That was really the background. Four years spent um, there and overseas uh, working at the Council of Europe. Um, in fact, during a very, very um, trying time for Europe, this was during the Bosnian Herzegovinian conflict, and I was at the Council of Europe uh, doing translation, hearing really, really horrific things uh, during those trials. So, yeah, learned a lot during that period, but what I've learned and the takeaway was how humans really need to communicate with one another. Well, that is a really terrific skill set. I mean, the ability to be able to really be able to empathize and negotiate and at the end of the day, be assertive, like you said, but still be able to let the other party know that you're willing to actually work with them uh, and, and do it in nice. a way that is uh, thoughtfully crafted, which by the way, um, is I'm sure coming has been very useful in your career because you were at Embarcadero Technologies for 12 years before you moved to Colorado and pursue startups. Um, but before I go there, uh, I believe you're into cycling, is that right? <laughs> yes, yeah, long, long time. Now I'm an old old guy, but yeah, I raced uh, bikes for many, many years um, at pretty high levels, now devoting almost all of my time to kids. I'm getting more kids on bikes, really, uh, cycling is an interesting thing. You almost have to deprogram children that because they feel so much pressure and just go and ride, uh, which is really what it should be about. Uh, you know, me as a you know nearly 50 year old man, I still cannot um, wait to get on my bike because of what it feels like. It just reminds me of being a kid. And I don't want these young kids to ever forget that. Yeah, actually, uh, this past weekend, I actually went to a men's retreat and did a, a short 40 miles. Um, so it was really invigorating. And of course, you, you know, San Francisco Bay Area is great for cycling, but then I'm just thinking yeah. Denver, uh, Colorado, and I think you're in Boulder now, just uh, incredible terrain for, for really mountainous, kind of all sorts of different terrains, right? It is. It's, um, it's wonderful. I lived in the Bay Area for almost 10 years, too, and they're both, you know, as, a, as I, I like to say, I'm a former crusty New Englander that left 20 <laughs> plus years ago and moved west as a young man and um, really, had, you know, uh, was just my heart is here in the west. Um, Colorado in particular, you're right. The, it, there is a the, – the terrain is not dissimilar to what you'd find in the Sierras in California – but you're dealing with radical elevation differences. You know, I live at 6,000 feet. Most of what we would typically ride is between 10,000 feet. Um, and this is what our kids, the, all the kids on our junior cycling team are sort of, they're, let's just say that they're fully acclimatized by the time that they're eight or nine years old. <laughs> 
Uh, it's it's amazing because I'm just thinking in some ways, uh, uh, you know, your kids and the natives they are have an advantage, um, and I think it kind of gives them a head start if they were seriously they're looking to compete in, within cycling. I agree. They're they're tough kids. I'm really <laughs> proud of their their achievements. So let's uh, shift the conversation to uh, your transition to startups. So you relocated from San Francisco Bay Area to Colorado, and you were part of the TechStar cohort of class of 2009. What was that experience like and how did that prepare you for subsequent successes in your current startup? So good question. But before I even sort of dive into the Techstars experience, it's almost irrelevant to talk about until you really look a little bit in arrears, like the Embarcadero experience, like, um, was so formative. Um, it, I have never worked for a big company and I probably never will. I like to, you know, achieve building bigger companies, but the building process and everything related to it, uh, I often call them barn raising experiences that every entrepreneur or aspiring entrepreneur should, you know, achieve. You really have to understand foundationally how things work from their earliest, most nascent periods from the idea to, hiring your first people and so on. Um, that, that experience over a decade in San Francisco um, from Embarcadero was just a tiny company selling, you know, during this period of this dot-com sort of explosion, we were um, selling software that actually had a real business model. Uh, you know, engineers, DBAs, data architects, they would trade their dollar for an actual product that we would give them and it worked other than the sort of aspiring, you know, new business models that the internet was trying to pursue. So when you take those lessons, we'll talk about mentors and stuff in the future, but when you take those basic foundational lessons of the effort of building something, marketing it, delivering it to a customer and seeing their visceral reaction of, wow, this really works and I love it. I took all of that into um, Techstars. And what we, my co-founder and I, you know, we, we departed from, you know, our traditional sort of IT backed companies. Um, and we moved into the world of sort of consumer goods. In this case, we were building um, consumer focused video technology. This predated, you know, Instagram and others, but we had this vision um, and we learned a lot. The vision that we had was um, how can a user of, and at the time, think of this as iPhone 3 and, you know, these very early days, 2007, 8, 9, how could someone, um, you know, record video and in effect um, introduce people to their moments in time, right, through their social graph? And what we found, and here's some foundational things for any aspiring entrepreneurs, this is, this is the most critical thing that I learned in Techstars. And frankly, it really became most apparent to us at the end. Um, uh, Blipsnips was the name of this company, and let's call it not a huge success, but the learnings that were baked in were this, and this is where Techstars was so valuable. Are you building a feature? Are you building a product or are you building a business? And we were building a feature and we were so focused and so passionate about executing on this thing. We couldn't see, we were building the leaf, not even the tree, but we couldn't see the forest and the opportunity was there, but the learnings, you know, when we did the postmortem on the business, it, this is really what it came down to. We, we you know, learned very late in our lesson um, that we did not aspire to really looking at how do, you, how do you change a category? How do you change, you know, the way markets look at things? We didn't, we couldn't see that. We couldn't see that forest that, was, that we were within at the time. So it was an amazing learning lesson. Techstars, you know, um, I'm indebted to a lot of that. I mean, we went through the progress or the program rather, we, we, we generated huge progress. Um, the other aspect of this is, you know, both my co-founder and I came from different things. We had some exits and we decided to be very self-sufficient and there's some goodness in that. And I'm, I mean that from a financial backing, we decided to be as self-sufficient as possible 
Uh, and I think we probably should have really, if we had stepped back and looked bigger at the, again, at the market opportunity, uh, we could have been more aggressive with outside capital. Um, but those are the learnings. Like there's, there's so much involved in that period of, of our lives, my life in particular, and that of my family. Do not forget, unless you're the proverbial 20-something-year-old in the garage and you are a 30-something-year-old year at the time we were with uh, families who need to be fed and ha we need to be housed and clothed, you are taking your entire family on that journey with you. So those that are about to set forth on that adventure, I, I'm not here to temper your, your aspirations, but you must understand what you know, could be the victims of your self-centeredness. You have to look holistically at what you're about to enter. A lot of great nuggets, uh, Greg, and I'm just thinking uh, where I start. Let's go back to Embarco, Embarcadero Technologies, which is that I think sometimes there is this kind of a myth and perception that uh, the startup founders are really very young, maybe fresh out of college, when in fact, the formidable years, the, the time that you spend in corporate America or at another startup really helps prepare some of the foundational things like you said before. And you see yeah. the full life cycle and specifically as a product manager, and that is so important to see it from womb to tomb, uh, that really helps you to gain confidence, a skill set, and of course experience so that when you are in your 30s or 40s and you're ready to execute, you're able to execute and execute well and successfully. The other thing you brought up, which is, I think, tremendous, really simple, but yet very powerful, which is that, are you building a feature, a product, or a business? And I think, especially for uh, technology or engineer-focused types of startups, it's very easy to get caught up in features. And I don't know how many successful, quote-unquote, startups have started out with features just to become decimated overnight because Apple, Facebook, because someone else basically assumed or basically implemented their own set of feature set into their overall platform. So I think that's a, that's a really great advice. And then the last one I think is uh, not talked about enough, frankly, and I, I, I know exactly what you're talking about, is that this journey is not just your independent journey. It affects people that are involved. And oftentimes, as founders, we have to raise capital within ourselves, our families, relatives. Uh, and if, if it goes sour, those relationships are, are forever damaged. And it, it's, a, it's right. a really serious thing, I think, you know, founders have to be really thoughtful about this and making sure I think one of the prudent things is, do you have enough assets preserved or set aside so that if you are in fact bootstrapping this thing, you can actually have a certain run weight. Run That's, weight. Right. That's exactly right. Uh, you know, we're gonna have this conversation uh, for, uh, forever, but let's get into Jump Cloud and what it is and how it actually helps users and their systems, you know, whether they're using a Mac or Linux or Windows. Uh, and be able to provide the access to the cloud and uh, open-prem resources. How does it work? And if you could also juxtapose, how is it different from Azure, uh, Active Directory, uh, Okta, Amazon Cloud Directory, One Login, or even Oracle Identity Management, for instance? Why is it different and why is it better? Good deal. Let, that's a lot. Let me sort of unpack a couple of those things. Let's talk about some of the foundational aspects, and then we can dip very you know, directly into the operational aspects of how Gem Cloud works, and then we'll contrast that against what we saw in the market. Um, if you go back in time, um, let me kind of walk you through a very brief history of Gem Cloud, just so you can get an understanding of things. Um, the idea, uh, in, incidentally, while I was building, you know, or finishing up my tenure and we were exiting um, Embarcadero, uh, and going into my sort of co-founding and founding some of these, these companies, um, Rajat Bhargava, who's the CEO uh, and a, a gentleman that I work with and have known for a long time, but I work with you know, every day super closely on crafting this business, had an idea while he was uh, the CEO of, a, of another uh, security company. And he basically um, was building technology that um, monitored servers at large scale, principally for the government sector. 
And that particular uh, set of servers had a very sort of obvious requirement and date this, this is around, you know, the early 2000s, mid 2000s. Um, and that requirement was you've got to integrate it with Microsoft back technologies. So they did because there was no other sort of solution. Um, there were some or open source variants, but largely, and even today, Microsoft still runs the epicenter of the enterprise IT stack. So he, he said very simply, why isn't anyone challenging this? And it was a little seed that sort of, you know, burned inside him for a long time. Meanwhile, I'm working uh, very closely uh, here in Boulder, building various companies, going through Techstars, doing all this stuff. But I, I ended up working extremely closely with a venture team here in Boulder, Colorado, uh, known as the Foundry Group. Um, they were former Mobius Capital. Um, these are folks building out a new fund to work on highly progressive, you know, principally internet-based startups, not always, but that was sort of an original thesis or focus of some of their early funds. And um, it comes to pass that Rajat has a very close set of connections to the Foundry Group and text, the Techstars Fund as, as a funder of that. And we were sort of paired together um, right at the right time. And that right time was uh, around 2013, late 2013, early 2014, when this, this idea was very nascent. Um, Raj, Raj, as we call him for short, um, had finally said, I think it's time to take a look at this idea again. Um, he's a consummate, you know, financially driven CEO. I am a consummate, you know, product nerd. <laughs> And like peanut butter and jelly, we decided to come together, form the strategy and craft the idea of the business. Um, and basically to move into your set of questions, what we really hypothesized was, um, I hate to sound cliche, but it was the right time for some disruption. Um, we saw that uh, lots of core or key technologies had already been, quote, lifted and shifted to the cloud. Um, if you look at things like the CRM, Salesforce blew that concept up in the early 2000s, 99, 2000. If you look later on, things like, you know, domain name services, were, which are a vestige of having to be managed on premise, were all moved to the cloud. And yet, continually, this one final major piece of technology, the, really the crown jewel, the epicenter of the IT stack, the directory, was still a vestige of an on-premise sort of need. We decided to, to change that. And moving forward, uh, when you look at GemCloud, what we, uh, in effect, built, and again, in the spirit of disruption, was two things. One, we wanted to prove that the idea of a foundational directory um, where, call it the, the, the source of truth for identities, where things, resources, what, be it your MacBook or a Windows machine or your wireless access, anything from any vendor could perform their authentication and authorization chores, but do that from the cloud. That was the, the sort of first hypothesis that we crafted in the business model. The other one was the model itself. And I want to be very, very clear. And this is really where we had to maintain a huge amount of discipline. We wanted to come at this in a way that was very anti-enterprise sales, to be very honest. Mm -hmm. This is not to disparage enterprise sales, but we really felt fundamentally that the time was right to offer a very complex solution, simplifying that solution, obfuscating a lot of those, you know, uh, complexities, uh, but make it so that an IT person could fall in love with it and immediately move to transacting without a ton of humans that may need to assist them on their journey. And so we wanted to shrink that time from, you know, the discovery of, the, you know, a solution to their pain to actually purchasing and moving forward with it quickly. And this really was, I don't want to say this is remarkable because there were plenty of other sort of solutions that you could drop a credit card in and move forward. But these are not as foundational as, again, the epicenter of your IT stack. And we did it. 
So those were the sort of the two prongs of quote disruption that we hypothesized. To get to specifics about uh, very quickly about um, the product, we looked at you know we're we're not here to you know again disparage a a company like Microsoft. In fact, we love Microsoft. In most of our companies, uh, customers have some semblance of Microsoft technologies that they're authenticating against Windows machines, Windows servers, Azure infrastructure is all, uh, you know, managed through us. So the concept of independence was very, very key for us. Uh, this is a, this is so important because um, one of the things I think Techstar is really well known for is this notion of just obsessing over market fit. And one of the dimensions of market fit is timing. And what you're talking about from a narrative is this notion that the maturity of cloud ecosystem was at a point where it was just right. It wasn't five years away, it wasn't 10 years away or five years past, but rather it was just right. And, and you're right, the Active Directory is kind of the heart, it's the entry point to everything. Yeah. Uh, the fact that it was still lagging behind and the fact that no one has ever challenged it. I mean, it, it was just begging to be disrupted. And I love the fact that uh, software as a service or, or service, this, you know, SaaS, or you, you guys call it Active Director as a service model, was so pivotal because if you did the traditional enterprise sales, you know, it really meant that you would have to go through the whole RFP, RFI. It's a lengthy process. It's a dis different kind of decision paradigm. But now you're actually allowing the IT professionals to actually be empowered, make that decision, and it becomes kind of a grassroots. And in some ways, a sales uh, a paradigm is completely flipped upside down. It's an upside down pyramid and actually increases and just they, they show the ROI internally to the stakeholders and it becomes almost kind of compelling for them not to, not to switch over completely. I, I, I perfectly well said, I may have to, you know, take that and put it, use it for some of our marketing materials, but the, you know, <laughs> I, I want to be very clear. There were amazing companies that uh, at the time that um, you mentioned a few of them, Okta, OneLog, and others that were building great businesses. Our view of that market sector at the time, again, 2013, 2014, was no one was declaring themselves as a directory in the most foundational sense of what we believed a directory needed to be. Again, very foundational. And there were these, these, these amazing businesses were being built uh, in large part predicated on, you know, when they sold their services, for example, single sign-on, the, the, the predication was that there would be a directory in place and they were adding incredible value to a Microsoft stack by providing these sort of federation and or single sign-on services. Really, it, in fact, um, improving the lives of the employees that worked at those companies. And we absolutely saw that, respected it. The thing was, though, we started from birth as a directory. It's a very different way to look at the problem. And I think that we, we sort of have awoken the industry to, wow, there is a, a hope that, you know, there, Microsoft doesn't have to be top to bottom the stack anymore. The other side to this was, the, the part of the market that was radically underserved were scaling, you know, startups, but really small to medium enterprises. You know, the, you know, let's say companies that are a few hundred employees to, you know, the low tens of thousands of employees that we serve. These are companies that, um, quite honestly, when you look around a modern organization and you, like, if I were to show you Jump Cloud through those doors, what we are physically, it looks like many of our customers, you walk into these offices and there's Cisco Meraki hanging above their heads, in large part, MacBooks, um, they have stand-up desks, there's no server closet. Uh, most of what they are computing on is in Amazon and their collaboration suite is G Suite. If you hear what I just said, their Microsoft was not mentioned once. Right. So what we were focused on is assisting those companies with what they needed, a singular way to unify an authentication strategy across all of that equipment and software and, and devices in a way that the, the IT person wouldn't necessarily be forced to make that painful call to Microsoft. It's like, well, Microsoft up there in Redmond, 
uh, we have all this stuff, but you're the only directory in town that we can tie all of this unique, in, you know, independent stuff together with. We wanted to prove that there's another way. And that's really what the foundation was. Uh, Greg, I, I, I'm just so excited. And, and from, a, from a pure business play perspective, this is very exciting because we're talking about market share. I mean, if, if you took even just a small slice of that Microsoft market share in the cloud and serve not only the enterprise, but the SMBs and those that are completely you know, non-native to, uh, to Microsoft product stack, uh, this is significant. And coming back to you, the point that you made is you chose intentionally not to pursue a feature product, but a business. That's uh, right. So that's really super exciting. We only have one minute left. And the question that we always ask is, what was your greatest uh, and, or biggest product innovation failure? And what's the lesson learned that you can share? I, I love the question. Um, it's always easy to gloat and sort of rub yourself with your greatest successes. Um, I've had my share of failures. I think the, the one that really uh, still to this day um, makes my heart weep <laughs> is this. As a very, very young product person, um, and as a, this is an Embarcadero story, as, a, as at the time we had gone IPO, um, we had a very successful IPO launch in 2000. Um, we were rich with, and we had to scale. Um, I drafted a, a business proposal to our board and to the executive staff at the time um, that there was a piece of technology that um, I was desperate to acquire. And I really saw the magic in this uh, piece of technology. You know, one in one makes three. We're going to, you know, accelerate into the market. We're at, at the time going to, you know, defend against the IBM rationals of the world. And um, uh, we did. They believed in, in the business thesis that I had created. And we went forward and, and acquired this piece of technology. Um, as it comes to pass, a couple of things really spoke to me in a post-mortem fashion. Number one, um, mixing technologies and thinking that you can force the integration often doesn't work. You need more than just the plan. And part of that is understanding the motivations of the company that we acquired. We weren't aligned. We thought we were, but we weren't. And enough due diligence was not performed there. And what you saw was tension. What you saw was an inability to collaborate. Um, what you saw was, in effect, customers who didn't get what they really needed. And I will forever take those lessons with me. Um, and if I fast forward to, you know, let's say 2007 and eight, where you know, the economic recession was hitting everyone, I was the one who had to say goodbye to everyone and lay them off. These were such foundational, impactful lessons that will never, ever, ever leave me. You know? So um, I, I counsel many young entrepreneurs to check their ego um, it, it, you know, the, your next big acquisition or your next big move could be your last. And you really need to understand the totality of the mission and the motivations because um, one and one may not make three. It may yield negative zero. <laughs> yeah, thank you so much for sharing the gravity of such a decision around m and And of course, if we look at Harvard studies and other uh, research, it shows that m and oftentimes results in dismal to even sometimes negative results. So it's not uncommon. Uh, thank you so much. I think that was really valuable. So today I've been joined by Greg Keller, Chief Strategy Officer at Jump Cloud. Thanks, Greg. It's been my pleasure, Scott.